all set with sound, all set with picture, lights are good. And we're recording. We have no kids. <laughs> no kids for the moment. <laughs> for the moment, exactly. <laughs> well, 11.30 when I was here is when the kids really started yeah, screaming. So, uh, so the first thing we're going to talk about is we're going to uh, basically just kind of talk about what it is that you do. So tell us who you are and tell us what your position is and uh, tell us a little more about what your position involves. Uh, my name is Douglas Schmidt, and am I talking to you or to the camera? Me. Okay. Uh, my name is Douglas Schmidt. Uh, I'm a set designer, mostly for live theater, but I have done film and uh, copious amounts of television. Um, uh, and I've been at it since about uh, since the mid '60s, around 1963 or four, when I first went to uh, New York from uh, Boston University. Um, I've worked on the East Coast. I worked on the East Coast for about 20 years, and then moved out here in the 80s, and have uh, been in the San Francisco Bay Area since then. Uh, but working nationally and internationally from this uh, location. Um, the uh, designer's job is really to interpret the playwright's and the director's vision of a particular piece and to make it not only uh, satisfy uh, the, the artistic needs of, of the play, but also the producer's needs, which have to do with primarily with money, uh, and uh, the uh, 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 aesthetic needs of the other members of the creative team. Um, so a set designer, when you first sit down, tell me what starts going through your mind when you've been given information from the director or you've read the script. Usually, your process? you get a script first um, before you even speak to any uh, other part of the creative personnel of a project. And uh, you read that and, and I personally try to keep an open mind about it and not not... Uh, um, form any real mental image of what what a uh, play or a musical or a show should look like, um, but just to get a feel of the thing and really start to identify um, the problems that will be encountered along the way as you as you uh, try to deal with all the competing needs of the uh, of the show. Uh, after that. Uh, I will typically meet with the director and we'll begin to free associate and simply bat ideas around. Uh, occasionally a director will have very firm visual uh, ideas about what he wants to see on the stage. But, but that really is seldom happens. It's mostly a hunt and peck system. Um, and, and some people, myself included, hunt and peck slower than, than others. It takes a while often to really come to a um, to a viable visual approach and uh, one that's consensual, one that uh, the, the director and the producer and the uh, uh, playwright and everybody can uh, sign off on. Um, a typical example of this was uh, a show I recently did out here in San Francisco, a musical treatment of um, Tales of the City, uh, Armistead Mopin um, series of novels that was uh, uh, adapted for the musical stage by uh, Jeff Whitty, a playwright who wrote Avenue Q, um, and uh, co uh, some composers uh, that uh, were fairly well known in the pop uh, area, uh, uh, had a, have a band called uh, Scissors Sisters. Um, and I've totally lost the thread of this. Well, we were talking about Developing the concept, ah, yeah, yeah, design, yeah. Uh, and 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 they uh, uh, came to the project not really being of San Francisco, not really knowing it, and that's that was a, a uh, just a bit of a challenge because really uh, it's all about the environment, and we're doing it for a San Francisco audience, so it had to resonate in a believable kind of way. Uh, 
Um, so the first thing that we did when I met the director was we took a walk. We just walked around San Francisco. I drove him to various locations that take uh, place in the script and we just walked the Filbert Stairs and the, uh, 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 the Land's End Woods and uh, all around, wherever uh, the locations were, to really give him a sense of the uh, atmosphere of the place and the, and the physicality of the terrain. So this helps you develop inspiration for yeah. the design. And, and uh, sometimes it has a double, that's sort of a double-edged sword because there is so much visual stimulus going on that it's really hard to start to edit that out and to, to uh, uh, winnow it down to essentials. I, um, uh, I, I felt pretty early on that because of the nature of the show, that particular show, which had many, many scenes, 50 locations, uh, 35, uh, uh, 35 locations and 50 scenes, uh, that we would have to get seamlessly from one location to another across town uh, in an instant or the show would stop dead in its tracks in the first 10 minutes. It had to be absolutely fluid and, and seamless in that way. Um, so that, just by sheer experience, I, I knew that that would uh, dictate a certain um, kind of unit set, one that could easily be transformed, but um, most of that transformation would probably come from the lighting treatment. And so I needed to make sure that whatever we did would take light well and would lend itself to that kind of transformational process. Uh, um, but it did take weeks, um, uh, almost a month, to come up with a, with a, a viable um, concept and then longer to uh, develop the actual playing areas and uh, come to an agreement on how much space you needed in any given location and how that space would be arranged and what kind of furniture would be brought in and all of the details that go with that. So that was a, a, a big project just in terms of the communication lines, keeping them open. The director was in New York, I was in San Francisco. Uh, uh, modern technology was our friend there because with email uh, it's very easy to shoot off a question and get an answer back without having to try and track him down on the telephone or uh, uh, set up a meeting time. And then, so, so once you're all kind of in agreement on this is the direction we're going to go in. Then what starts to happen in terms of your artistic? Then I will project? start uh, to do chicken scratches. Uh, simple line drawings, very uh, uncomplicated, hopefully uh, communicative uh, ideas. Uh, not go too far into solving the, the technical problems that are inevitable, uh, but just to get the ball rolling uh, what do you think of this? What do you think of this? Here's a photograph I found. What do you think of that? And uh, uh, research, the, the research for San Francisco was fairly easy, easily done. I mean, it's right out my window, so it wasn't really a problem. And literally, the set ended up being what was out my window when I lived in the neighborhood that uh, uh, is the primary uh, setting for the show. And so we go from chicken scratch drawings, thumbnail sketches, into something that... Into something, again, not working with electronic media at all, uh, working by hand on an old-fashioned drafting table with triangles and scale rules, uh, pushing the space around, trying to uh, mediate between the onstage needs and the offstage needs, which were copious in this particular instance because there were any time that there was nobody on stage, everybody was off stage changing their clothes. So it had to be uh, uh, carefully planned in terms of that. And we had to design across the back of the stage. There were eight dressing rooms, individual dressing rooms for chorus and principals and so forth, because they could never leave the stage. They never had time to go to their, uh, back to their dressing room after the curtain had gone up. And then the construction drawings go out and then your interfacing with the shop. Tell me about that. Well, you, before we even get to the cons construction drawings, which for me is the last step in the process, um, uh, something needs to be um, 
presented as a sort of a final idea. And in this case, uh, and in, in, in the past, and I've used with great success, is kind of a combination of building a model, uh, photographing that model, and then using Photoshop over that, um, showing the variations that uh, it would take to make the, the different scenes. And the, the, uh, uh, in the case of Tales of the City, that produced quite a volume of work. There were uh, uh, many, many versions of, uh, of different scenes, scenes some uh, quite uh, radically different and some with just tweaking colors or, or just prop details or something. Mm -hmm. So th that was quite a lengthy process. That took quite a while and uh, uh, because I was just kind of, uh, this was the first time I'd ever used that uh, uh, concept over working a photograph model on a big musical. Uh, it took some time to just figure out how to keep track of all the elements that you're uh, inevitably uh, throwing into the bin. So then once that happens, then we start to go into... Then we get an specific. okay, and then we have this kind of nether region, this, this unfortunate uh, land that's unpredictable of uh, presenting it to the producers, and they have to make some sort of decision first if it's uh, artistically what they uh, anticipated, and in this case it definitely was, but more important, can they afford it? Um, and in this case, they couldn't. Uh, so we had to go back, we had to make some changes, but we also had to, um, uh, the reality was it was a big show. And no matter what we did, it was gonna be a big show. So they had to go out and raise more money to afford to do it. Not atypical. Um, you usually don't run into that in the uh, regional theater um, uh, or, or these uh, uh, resident theater companies uh, because they're kind of, you know, they're budgeted for the season and they've got a, uh, uh, a, a, a finite amount of resource that they can dedicate to a project. But in this case, there was enough uh, uh, community interest to uh, enable them to go out and go and find, some, go more find some more dough. Yeah. yeah. Uh, okay, so let's talk about the now we're into con now we're you know we're, we producers looked at it he's blessed it and now we're going to go into construction drawings now we go into construction that. drawings this is the this is the part where um, um, uh, probably 15 years ago I lost interest <laughs> uh, the construction drawing part is uh, is very tedious and very time consuming and and the attention to detail is ultra important at this stage because generally that's what they're going to build. So you want to make sure that the specifications that you give them are really what you want to see on stage. Um, uh, in the last maybe 20 years, um, I have switched over almost entirely to uh, CAD drawings and the shops want CAD, CAD drawings. It's been a sea change in the business. Um, but uh, being of an age where um, uh, making that uh, gear shift uh, work uh, seamlessly is not possible, uh, I'm fortunate that I have a pool of talent that can come to my rescue and uh, put them in various places with their little laptops tapping away endlessly uh, to come up with the drawings. The, 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 the computer age uh, has, has many benefits, and, and one of which is the, uh, uh, when you're doing a project uh, um, for the theater, uh, change is the name of the game. You have to remain flexible right up until the moment the hammers fly and often after that. So you, you want to, um, uh, maximize the uh, your ability to respond to, to changes as they come down the road. They usually happen in the rehearsal process, which of course inconveniently is exactly when you're building things. Um, too bad it couldn't, uh, they couldn't rehearse the thing and then <laughs> build it, but that's the name of the game. Um, so I, uh, uh, I like very much um, CAD for, the, for its ability to um, uh, to uh, generate a whole new drawing 
um, uh, rather effortlessly by simply moving lines around. Getting there, however, is another question. The initial edition, the first draft, if you will, or the, or the first set of working drawings, uh, or a final set of working drawings, is really very time consuming. I don't find it any faster than doing it by hand, frankly. Um, it, it, it's just a whole different kind of work. Um, uh, but, it, uh, but in the end, uh, because there are all these changes that are inevitably coming down the, the line, uh, I find that uh, it, it makes life an awful lot easier. And uh, tell me about your interfacing with the shop now that we're into construction. How do you interface with the shop? What is there? It, uh, interfacing with the shop it, it, uh, tends to be uh, uh, complex and uh, time consuming. It's, it's something that you need to keep on top of every single day. There are a million questions. The phone rings constantly. Uh, you have to be able to respond to it in a timely manner because they've got people standing there, burning up the bucks, waiting for a decision to come down the line. Where is that wallpaper? What is it going to be? Where do, we're go do we have to send to Canada for it? Can we get it locally? You know, that kind of uh, question uh, are, are, are always in the... Uh, uh, hopper, and you you really need to stay uh, pretty fast on your feet. How do you deal with changes when you're, say, I don't know, halfway into construction, and the producer or the director says, "Well, that's those stairs aren't the right way, or they're not the right color." Tell me how you deal with changes. Well, first of all, you go to the shop and say, "We have time to fix this." And then if they say yes, then you've got to find out how much it's going to cost because there will be an extra charge. No question about it, um, and that will impact the bottom line. And they, 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 the producers have to be um, prepared for that kind of. Uh, uh, Inevitability. It it happens. It always happens. Sometimes it's large, sometimes it's small, but um, it's pretty much the same the same process. I've been very lucky uh, in my career, um, having very uh, worked with very uh, talented and uh, quick thinking and. Uh, uh, just plain good people in the technical end. Um, uh, the shops generally exist by virtue of their uh, uh, ability to service the uh, designers and the producers, and they they, they have a, a vested interest in in uh, uh, being accommodating. But there are some times when you know they just go, "Man, it's already built. You want to, really want to you really want to do this?" Um, and the Costs then can spiral crazily out of control. So you want to protect yourself on that end. You can't. I can't just uh, say over the phone, "Yeah, go ahead and build it." It's got to go th back through the whole process again uh, of uh, reconceiving, redesigning, re uh, 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 bidding, and uh, uh, drawing. Let's talk a little more about the relationship you have with those technical people? Mm. They are, uh, for me, the most crucial relationships. You really want to feel uh, that whatever happens, they've got your back. That, that uh, the shop and the, uh, the master carpenter and the crew will in some way come to your rescue and won't just kind of leave you hanging out there uh, to dry. And uh, like I say, I've been very lucky on that score. The other um, uh, most uh, important member of the team, uh, just in terms of um, keeping the communication lines open, is the stage management uh, department. And uh, I, I can't, couldn't emphasize enough how important the stage manager is for a designer. They are the eyes and the ears, and they are there in every minute of the rehearsal, and they can anticipate the problems, and they can give you a heads up a week before uh, the shit hits the fan. It, it's um, uh, it's v extremely crucial uh, to have a good relationship with the uh, stage management staff. Tell me about... Doug, just move up two inches. Okay. Right, perfect. Thank right you. Okay. 
Um, let's talk about, um, I'm going to jump around here a little bit, but stay with the script. Okay. Uh, <laughs> and then we'll jump after you get through. Let's get through all these items first and then. Uh, let's talk about, uh, the camaraderie, the family, the, you're talking about how, you know, the crew and they have your back. Uh, I want to talk a little more about the the relationship, how trust plays into it, and how you rely on them mm. for those kinds of things. Yeah. The, um, uh, w when I first started, I had no track record. Um, the the first show I ever designed, professional show I ever designed, was. Um, if I got, if I remember this right, was a production for the New York Shakespeare Festival. Joe Papp directed uh, a, a Shakespeare play called King John uh, in Central Park, and I uh, uh, I was asked to design that, and it was a, you know, that was a big deal um, uh, for me at that time, and but aside from being kind of an assistant. Uh, who showed up at a shop occasionally uh, or not. I, they, I was kind of an unknown quantity. And I was extremely fortunate that the, um, uh, the sh shop that Shakespeare Festival used in those days uh, and a big supporter of the Shakespeare Festival was a, a man named Pete Feller who uh, ran a shop in the Bronx, um, Feller Scenery Studios, uh, who was a Great, a fabulous showman. I mean, he was a great guy, and uh, uh, I mean, kind of a mini P.T. Barnum in his own way. And uh, he would take young designers under his wing, and in this kind of big daddy sort of way, would say, "Stick with me, kid. I won't let you go wrong." And uh, uh, and in fact, he did. He he really was. Um, that kind of guy. He loved this. He loved to uh, play up that angle into a kind of. Uh, uh, I can't really describe it, but it was uh, a. a uh, it was a. We had a great relationship, and I. I, I had many shows that, after that, uh, subsequent to that, that went through his shop, and always uh, would anticipate problems and give the designer the benefit of the doubt when, uh, you know, I wasn't quite clear what the detail on that was going to be, but uh, I didn't really draw it. So he would uh, interpret it or always to the benefit of the design rather than to the detriment of it. Um, a uh, great guy from a long line of uh, theater uh, family. Uh, 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 his dad was a stagehand at the Met, I think, and before that, his his uh, grandfather came to America as a uh, ship uh, on a ship on a sailing ship as a part of the crew as a rigger, of course, because um, that's really where most of our uh, uh, most of the stage technology in those days came from was was rigging sailboats, and uh, the stagehands and uh, uh, sailboat crews were almost uh, interchangeable. Tell me uh, if, if the, uh, the the word magic gets used a lot in our, in in our business. You know, this is making the magic, or we make the magic happen. What is what is the the word magic in our business? What does that mean to you? Well, my very first experience in a live theater. My parents took me to uh, a performance of Blackstone the Magician at the Taft Auditorium in Cincinnati, Ohio. And I was hooked from the moment the curtain went up. The, uh, the illusions, this, just the, the simple uh, mystique of somebody on a stage surrounded by black uh, was, was overpowering. And from that moment, I understood, uh, though I certainly couldn't have articulated, the value of transformation. And 
I've always felt, and, and I use it uh, uh, just in common everyday language, and, and especially when talking to collaborators, this is the magic moment. This is the moment where the audience can't expect anything. This is what we're shooting for. This is where we start the design, and we work both ends of it into that point. Um, so magic, for, and, and as a child, I was uh, a child magician and had a little act and I toured all the great birthday parties in uh, Cincinnati, Ohio <laughs> with my uh, fabulous magic act. Um, uh, so, so magic is not just some sort of abstract idea that's hard to define, it's, it's really uh, uh, a, a concrete thing. It is suckering the audience in to thinking one thing and then showing them something else. So hopefully very surprising. What is it like for you when it's opening night, everything is done, and maybe you're in the house, maybe you're not. Tell me what you're feeling as the audience comes in and the curtain goes up. Well, usually I'm in coet at that point. I'm completely, I don't know what I'm thinking. I'm, we've usually uh, uh, probably lost a week's sleep by then or, or, or whatever. But uh, uh, it is my favorite moment in, in uh, the process because uh, no matter what has gone wrong, what chaos has reigned, always in the back of my head is the curtain always goes up. And when it does, there's a great sense of relief that the, the project is finally launched. Because it, in, in many cases, it could be a year that you've been working on something. And, and that, uh, that is really a, a major commitment. I'm, I'm, I'm glad I'd, it's not a job like that's got 40 year life to it, because I would never uh, last it. It's interesting because the next question I was going to ask you is, what is your favorite part of what you do? <laughs> well, my favorite part is really the, the, the family that is accumul accumulates around a project, is the uh, relationships that go into that, is the collaboration between the director and the playwright and the composer and the uh, designers. Um, uh, that's, that's, that is more it than the actual physical doing of the job or the, uh, uh, the set. My happiest um, uh, memories of the business were all always sent around uh, when I was either a resident designer somewhere or, or when I was um, a uh, uh, you know, a, a recurring uh, um, designer in, in some places, like, like the Old Globe in San Diego, for example. I worked there for like 15 or 20 years and would do one or two shows a year. Um, so it was always like coming home, uh, uh, back to familiar faces and, and uh, 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 I mean, a great place to live and to work. And, and you could go there for two months and uh, do a couple of shows and so a family atmosphere. so it's really a family atmosphere uh, the fact that it, it would revolve around the theater was just icing on the cake um, my I, I always say that the four years I spent at Lincoln Center as the resident designer uh, for the repertory theater at the, the Vivian Beaumont uh, was the happiest time of my life it, and it really was I could go to work, walk to work every day um, uh, there was always something challenging, always something interesting going on there. And uh, uh, the only bad part is that, of that is we always had to work the Christmas break. <laughs> but uh, uh, but that, was the, that was the worst of it. So the collaboration with other departments, the lighting, the, the costumes, uh, tell me a little bit about how you have to think about that and how you have to collaborate with those people when you're designing this. Well, it's, it's very important, um, mostly in terms of, uh, uh, my, my real focus is with the lighting designer. It's very important to me that what 
we've either done in a sketch or that we've done on, uh, uh, you know, an electronic illustration or uh, whatever the director has signed off on, we can approach um, on stage. And sometimes uh, my uh, eyes are bigger than our ability to serve the meal. Um, but uh, it's that uh, interaction that I find the most critical in terms of, because, because you're going to spend, say, a month uh, sitting with somebody um, and you hope that they've done their homework uh, to the point where you can say, eh, you know, that really should be a blue light. What do you got up there? And they'll be able to respond to that. Um, I, I try not to get involved in the queuing process too much uh, unless I f really feel that we're missing some dramatic thrust. Or so. But but mostly it's, it has to do with the choice of the colors and the choice of the patterns of the light and the atmosphere that it creates. So more so the lighting designer than any other. Yeah, uh, the costume designer of course is important, but they have their own set of priorities. Right. and And they... Uh, I mean, typically when, when I come into a production, I'm the first to board. So by the time the costume designer is ready to sit down and uh, do their work, um, which might be a month later, uh, may not even be cast yet uh, by the time I'm involved with it, uh, uh, the, the, the uh, template for the show is pretty well, well set by the time they come in. So their job is to respond to that and, uh, um, and, and coordinate in such a way so that it's compatible, the period and, uh, and the color and the, the sweep of the production feels uh, of a piece. Uh, do you have any, uh, I'm, sure you, I'm sure you've got more than a couple, but any stories that you want to share with us about things that happened or things that went wrong or things that were funny or? Well, uh, I'm of an age where my, my memory has uh, begun to flag, but there are those indelible moments th that uh, uh, the opening night of Samson and Delilah, a large opera production that I did here for, uh, uh, in 1980, in 1980, uh, at the San Francisco Opera, uh, uh, directed by uh, uh, a, f a French gentleman named, uh, uh, gone out of my head, um, uh, and really that whole opera for a designer, it's big, it's grand, there's a lot of stuff in it, but the big deal is solving the end, the last bar of music when the temple falls down. And if you can't deliver that, then you're failed. So uh, I came up with an idea uh, of how this might work. Um, critical uh, collaboration between myself and the lighting designer, who was Tom Munn, um, great lighting designer. Um, and we routined this thing and it had a lot, a lot to do with, the, with split second timing of a fly, number of fly cues and light cues and smoke and this and that and all these elements had to come together at exactly the right moment for it to work. And it sort of worked in rehearsal and then it sort of didn't and then it sort of did again. And there we were at opening night because in opera you don't get these months of rehearsal, you get whatever they'll throw at you and you'll be thankful for that. Um, and it was, uh, we got to this final, that was the only tension that I had in the evening, I, the rest of the thing I knew was fine. Uh, was this moment gonna work, this magic moment where this whole bloody thing fell down around our ears? And the cue came and everything fired exactly when it was supposed to, great stage manager calling it perfectly, bang, bang bang and just as the roof literally the roof fell in on uh, poor Placido Domingo chained to this set that he couldn't possibly get out of uh, somebody in the audience screamed and it was the best moment of my life because it worked exactly the way it was supposed to work and interestingly enough 
in subsequent productions, I'm, and I wasn't there for them, uh, I was told that something would be off, something didn't quite work, the fly cue didn't come at the right, whatever. Uh, I don't know that we ever actually really did replicate that opening night moment, but it was a great moment and it was mentioned in the review and, and uh, the audience uh, uh, f f uh, applauded and then laughed because they realized they'd been suckered into it. It, it was a really a great uh, uh, experience and, and my, one of my favorite uh, so the magic stories. happened. The magic happened. And the magic on happened. cue. On which cue. <laughs> I love the screen. What year was that? Uh, 1980. Do you have any other um, name dropping? We love the name dropping, you know, like when uh, Speedy's talking about touring with the Stones and backstage, you know, this stuff and that. I mean, no, it's, yeah. It's fun to hear some of the, um, you know, on the bigger plays, the, uh, you know, some of the actors that came in. And we're not necessarily looking for things that they did because Speedy... Speedy couldn't tell us, obviously, a number of things that the Stones did. Yeah. Right. You know, we right. Would, but it's just, right. uh, well, I'm you know, just going to, I was going to. like gonna... Pacini talking about working with great actresses and how, how professional they were. and mm. um, Or, in some direction. cases, how unprofessional they were. I, yeah, yeah. I, you don't have to mention names when you're saying. No, but I, 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 actors generally tend to be fairly generous. Singers, on the other hand, tend to be very self uh, centered, and uh, I, mean, I, I mean, countless uh, stories. We we did a production of Aida uh, 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 with uh, the great uh, Pavarotti here, uh, and a, a wonderful uh, uh, Aida named uh, 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 Margaret Price, um, and they were both kind of in their large states at that time. Um, and I always remember Pavarotti, they would have to clinch. And it was, you know, hard enough for them to get close enough together to get into a two shot. But the, the thing that he would always do is grab her and then slightly turn her away from the audience. <laughs> and you could just see her going, all right, trying to get back but he was big and he got older there it was it was it was funny actually i mean it, it, it kind of feeds into the archetypal uh idea of the uh, uh of the tenor as the center of the universe when you when you look back over your career do you have favorite moments? Do you have favorite times? Do you have favorite places and plays that you weren't on? Well, like I, I said, the, the, uh, uh, that time at Lincoln Center was particularly good. I was in, in, um, at a stage in my career where I was uh, uh, still hungry and anxious to, uh, uh, to make, a, uh, make a splash and also um, uh, happy to be able to do it in an a, uh, um, environment that, that was conducive. Uh, uh, the uh, fellow that uh, ran the theater, uh, a gentleman named Jules Irving, father of Amy Irving, um, uh, was, a, was a wonderful gentleman and a wonderful person to work for. Uh, I, and I was, I've always been very grateful and thankful that, that uh, he sign me on to uh, kind of manage the uh, design department. I didn't design everything um, that went through there. There were occasional guest designers, but mostly I was responsible really for making sure that the uh, needs of the backstage were, were, uh, were met and uh, uh, that we get the show on. Anything else? Yeah, would you look into the camera and say, the magic happens. <laughs> the magic happens. Perfect, thank you. Where, I'm sorry, where did you say uh, Jules Irving? Uh... Uh, he was uh, Repertory Theater of Lincoln Center. He ran oh. that for, uh, I guess, about eight years. Well, even longer, because he came with her Blau from the San Francisco Actors Workshop to, to take over Lincoln Center when the first iteration of it fell apart 
uh, which was Kazan and, and Robert Whitehead and a whole group of luminaries who, who gave it their best shot and then uh, kind of stepped away from it. So we had um, history of set design. I think, I think we kind of got, did, did we get into that where I know you, 